Hinchinbrook Island in front of us. This is the southern end. We're going to go all the way up on the inside of the channel to the northern end and around into Ramsey Bay where we'll disembark. <laughs> this area is Lucinda. This is the Lucinda Sugar Jetty. It's the longest jetty in the southern hemisphere at about 5.7 kilometers in length. everybody. You can see behind us this very large island landmass. Uh, this morning we actually took a boat from Lucinda in the south. You would have seen uh, Lucinda the port as we left that very long jetty that was in the background and also the northernmost of the palm group of islands called Polaris Island. We then traveled up to the north through the channel between Hinchinbrook Island, the mainland, and we headed up and in the north of us is a group called the Family Islands. And that's going to be very important uh, when we're talking about Hinchinbrook during this trip, because there's a particular island on there called Dunk Island or Penangalbar in the traditional owner's language. And just at the moment, we'll take a moment to uh, pay respect to the traditional owners of the land, the Banjan or saltwater people. And they inhabited this island here, which they called Mudda Mudda Nami. And uh, so we'll probably call it that for the rest of the trip because that's its actual original name. And there's a great story about the forming of the Southern Cross that starts up in Dunk Island or Penangalba and ends here in Mudda Mudaname or Hinchinbrook Island. Uh, it's Australia's largest island national park. It's about 50 kilometres long, about 10 kilometres wide at its widest point. When it was first discovered in 1770 by Captain Cook when he came up the coast, he was actually a long way out to sea. And he thought that the island was actually part of the mainland, so he just called it Hinchinbrook Mountain. Uh, in 1819, Philip Parker King, another early explorer, came up the coast here, and he thought that it was actually separate from the mainland. And it wasn't until 1843, uh, when Captain Blackwood on the HMS Fly came up here, that he discovered the southern entrance, or the southern point of the channel, and it was renamed appropriately Hinchinbrook Island. So this is where me and a couple of friends, Andy and Goldie, are going to spend the next four days hiking and checking out the place. So we'll stop at a few places and tell you a few things about it. But once again, welcome to Mudda Mudda to me. And just take a moment to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners, the Banjan people of the area. So we've come off the beach now, heading into the trails to the interior of the island. And we're in a nice little rainforest area at the moment. So we're hiking the little trail along a saddle on the side of Hinchinbrook Island and we've been through a nice little rainforest area for about 20 minutes now and we're coming back out onto the coast. You can see that uh, the beach, the dune area cuts off this little freshwater area and you can see the pandanus palm right here and also these melaleucas growing so that tells us that this is all fresh water in here the melaleuca and the pendanus do very well around this area we've just hiked up to the top of nina bay lookout and if we look further out we can see uh, directly in front of us a bunch of estuaries pouring out into the big bay over there uh, this is a massive mangrove area and we came in that this morning on our boat. We've walked along a little portion of Ramsey Bay over here this morning and then we've made our way inland and up through a nice rainforest area into a open woodland forest. But uh, panning around this way, of course, we can see that beautiful beach on Ramsey Bay there again. Coming down, we're standing right above a nice eucalypt forest below us there and then that heads down in to Nina Bay. You can see a lot of the island is predominantly granite landmass. It's been eroded away leaving these huge craggy peaks 
very beautiful and very epic scenery along here. Uh, we've just made our first rest stop of the day for some lunch in beautiful Nina Bay. Okay, so here we are on Zoe Bay Beach at the moment. Sun's come out, very nice. So there's a couple of silver gulls flying overhead. But you can see a uh, beautiful beach here and then looking back at the island itself, very mountainous. I was talking about those uh, granite peaks that you can see. Um, very cragged and rocky, being eroded away here. Absolutely spectacular place. Uh, lots of coconut palms amongst the casuarinas that are lining the beach here as well. We're now navigating across Boulder Bay. Not sure why it's called Boulder Bay. Or, or. We've now made it past Boulder Bay through another section of forest and we're out to Little Ramsey Bay. Beautiful little freshwater creek pouring out. You can see the wonderful mountains. We've traveled about seven and a half kilometers today along the island. If you look back to the far point of the island back there and you come forward a little, you'll see a big sandy area. That's uh, Ramsey Bay where we started this morning and we've wound our way around the coast and come all the way through pockets of rainforest, open woodland forest, up over headlands, along beaches, and we've made our way to this beautiful little camp spot here on the other side of Little Ramsey Bay. Beautiful morning sunrise, white-bellied seagull out on the water. It's cruising around here. There's been a dolphin out in the bay this morning and it's hurting up some fish. It looks like this white-bellied seagull is attempting to jump in on that. It's a pot of bottlenose dolphins working. There we go, one's just come up here. They've been working this shallow area this morning. Another one just came up now. In here, ch herding the fish into the bay. Uh, there's a group further out as well. <clears throat> this group's come in a little bit shallower now. And now we're just in the final stages of preparation to depart and head off for our second day's hiking. We did about seven and a half k's yesterday. We've got about 10 ahead of us today. So we're heading off in a southeasterly direction over these rocks into the forest. And away we go. One of the absolute pleasures of this hike is cruising around the coastline and coming to bay after bay, pristine beach. The other great thing about these soft sand beaches is being able to spot these tracks. And these are from a wallaby that has uh, hopped down here this morning and then headed back up into the bush in front of us. The trail's now taking us away from the coast, Banksia Bay in the foreground there. Coming around, we're, you can hear that water source. Beautiful creek down here. So we're going through a mixture of environments here. Mainly eucalypt forest at the moment, but we're going in and out of rainforest as well. So we're just taking a break up on the hill here and you can see we're in very typical Australian bush right now, surrounded by uh, some eucalypts and banksias and a few of the casuarina trees as well, the ones with the very needle-like leaves, but right in front of us here we have these grass trees. There's lots of them here. You can see that wonderful stem that forms or shaft that st forms in the center of the grass trees, which becomes a flower. It takes a few years for these guys to be able to ma produce a flower, but uh, they're an incredible uh, tolerant species. Some actually rely on fire to germinate. Uh, underneath the surface, their root system is filled with microbes called mycorrhiza, which help to uptake nutrients for the tree itself, in, especially in times of hardship. When there are pollinated birds and, and butterflies and things will come in and feed off the, the pollen that comes on these trees, and then it turns into a hard resin. And uh, Aboriginal people can use the uh, resin for glue, 
when they're making spears they can use the actual shafts here to make a, uh, a spear shaft as well so lots of wonderful traditional uses as well all right so on the track in front of us we've got a red-bellied black snake it's beautiful they are an elapid so they are a venomous snake so we'll give it its due and leave it to do what it needs to do uh, so the elapids are the front fang snakes they produce venom uh, which they then inject through those front fangs into their prey which paralyzes them and then they devour them but looks like this one's onto the scent of something here it's been on the path here because obviously you can see it's nice and open it's a cool morning here uh, with the breeze blowing through so it's good for it being a reptile to be at in this uh, warmer weather but it doesn't seem too bothered with us so it's great So we've made our way back down off the mountain where you can see behind us here there's a, there's a lot of waiter wild palms in there with mixed amongst the melaleucas and the uh, iliocarpus. We're going to head into the full marshland soon. We're at a river crossing at the moment. You can see this beautiful sand that's been made up of broken down granite boulders over the years. So it's made up this incredible beautifully coloured riverbed that we're going to cross here. Head up over the top of this beautiful big buttress route. Okay, so now we're coming out of that little rainforest area now, and we're right on the edge of the ecotone, the transitional spot between the rainforest and this swampland forest. You can see lots of melaleucas, these paper barks in here. Uh, again, there's many of these grass trees that are growing here, but uh, during the wet season, this will be inundated with water, which is what's causing this uh, marshland. And in fact, we're about to come up to another ecotone where we can see a transition into mangrove areas. So you can see the trees low lying in the background there, some taller ones from there. So this is another ecotone between these grasses here and the mangrove area. And uh, then we'll be back, it looks like, into some more of the swampland on the other side. We're just coming around from the swampland forest with the paper barks and the pandanus. We're coming up to a creek crossing, but it's always good to remember that in uh, North Queensland here, there can be crocodiles, Australian crocodiles in the areas. Be very careful. So here's the creek crossing that we're coming up to. This will be brackish water, a mixture of fresh and salt in here. We can see some mangrove trees lining the banks there, the rhizophora with those large prop roots. Again, we can see a bunch of these melaleucas a bit further back where the fresh water would be predominant. So this creek would run fresh from back here during the wet season, and then it will head down and meet its tidally adjusted friend here and become brackish, but a beautiful little area for lunch, I think. We had lunch a little bit further up the creek bed here. I'll just pan around now, you'll see where Andy and Goldie are over there, but uh, this is a beautiful little area around here. Another beautiful river crossing. Now we're in some real swampland. Nice and deep. We're coming out from the forest. The boys are excited under this beautiful beach here at Zoe Bay. So we've made it to Zoe Bay. Just need to traverse the beach to the southern end for our camp spot tonight but what a great walk through so many different environments we've just walked a little ways up off the beach into a beautiful little campsite here got my little tent set up already the guys are hanging up there 
hammocks, the tent hammocks for the night. This is where we'll camp and you can see everything's got to be hung up on these areas here because we get the white-tailed rat or the melamies on this island. Looking back at the peaks of Hinchinbrook, coming around to the beautiful Zoe Bay. So this is the view from our campsite. Here's the reward for our walk today. We've come up to have a swim and a clean in Zoe Falls in this beautiful pool down the bottom here. And uh, tomorrow we'll be climbing up here and heading off for our next step. Here comes Andy, charging Yee! through. Another beautiful day as the sun starts to rise in Zoe Bay. It's about that time to move on from Zoe Bay. It's been a great evening, beautiful morning. Now to head back up here towards the river mouth, follow a path all the way up past the falls again and we'll get up to the top and then move further south. We're back at Zoe Falls this morning and just stopping again to appreciate how beautiful this area is before we head up further to the top of the falls and have a look down over the bay. So great morning here, beautiful winter's morning, about 21 degrees Celsius at the moment. It'll get up to about 26 or 27. We're about halfway from the hike up to the top of the falls here. You can now see further out there at the northern end of Zoe Bay. Just completed this little rope climb section of the walk. We are at the top of Zoe Falls where the river feeds into the falls. You can see the mountain ranges behind once again. This beautiful river winds its way down here, down into these pools. And you can see that beautiful, picturesque Zoe Bay in the distance as well. So we've left the top of the falls now, and we're heading on our trip. Going through, we'll be going through some more forest soon, past these wonderful rivers and creeks, heading on for our afternoon destination. Continuing along our walk, we've got the creek here. We've got a fantastic trail we're going up right beside it. Beautiful grevilleas, grass trees, some wattles in here as well. So down off the top of the mountain, we're now back into a nice rainforest environment. We've been up the hill. We're going between uh, two peaks, so we're in a valley at the moment. This beautiful valley is taking us down through a wonderful area where there's obviously a lot of water catchment during the wet season. So there's a few seasonal streams and things here, but we're also getting these beautiful rainforest plants and you can see a huge section of wait a while palm in the middle there. We've now come back out of the rainforest. We're on the side of a mountain on a trail and uh, out to the sea you can see the northernmost of the palm group of islands, Polaris Island. Right next to that is Orpheus Island and the channel in between is the Kurikawa Channel 
there's a small island between that called Kuroko Island and then that big island you can see behind Orpheus is actually Great Palm. Right down to the south there, that double humped island there, that is Havana, that's the southernmost island in the Palm group. And spinning around we can see the Lucinda area and the sugar terminal that we saw as we departed the other day. And then heading back around here, we're sort of right off the side of Mount Diamantina at the moment. All right, so we're coming back down from the uh, point that we were just on on the side of Mount Diamantina. Looking behind us here, this is Mount Diamantina. Uh, very well easy to see because you can see there's a huge sort of rectangular block of granite sitting on top there. So that's a good way to tell that you're looking at Mount Diamantina. Just wanted to bring it up quickly uh, because the Banjan people or the saltwater people uh, that lived here on Matamataname originally have a story about that mountain. And uh, what it is, is they had what we would call, I guess, a witch lady or a very powerful lady in their tribe. And they were quite scared of her because things started to go wrong. So they banished her from the tribe and she was fearful that they were going to take her life. So she ran to the top of Mount Diamantina here and she summoned all the clouds to come down and sit on top of Hinchinbrook Island, particularly across Mount Diamantina there. So she would be protected and they wouldn't be able to find her. And strangely enough, on today, we have completely clear peaks on Hinchinbrook Island or Maramaraname. And, but generally throughout the year, it's very common to see cloud cover across the top of these peaks, which is basically this lady bringing down that cloud cover on top of uh, Maramaraname here. So it's a wonderful thing for us today. She's obviously very happy that we're here and she's let us have a clear day so that we can see the peaks nicely. We're now down off the hill and at Diamantina Creek. So this is a great spot to stop, fill up the water bottles, have a quick swim, and then head off for our lunch a little bit further down. There's Andy jumping in. Oh, there he goes. <laughs> nice. Again, moving on further down the path, we've hit another section of forest, which is just inundated with these amazing granite boulders here. They've actually fashioned some steps out of them for us as well. Just ever-changing environments here on Hinchinbrook or Maramaraname. Here we are at our final camp night on Maramaraname. And tomorrow we have a sort of a short half-day walk to where we'll be picked up. But tonight we'll be camping right by Mulligan Falls here. It's going to be a great area to hang out in tonight. Beautiful swimming pool down the bottom there. So I've climbed up the falls a bit now. You can see them sliding down there. It would be an awesome natural water slide, but I think the end might be a little bit rough. Look at that beautiful pool down there, and then you can see back out the sea out there as well. Right next to a beautiful swimming hole, Mulligan Falls, we can see this wonderful, very Australian tree, the wattle tree. And looking out across this swimming hole and up into the sunlight, a beautiful example of the wattle tree up there. Okay guys, I just thought I'd share with you one more story before the end of the trip. It's another story from the Banjan or Saltwater Tribe here on Maramaraname or Hitchinbrook Island that we're hiking on at the moment. Now this story starts further north in a group of islands called the Fermi Islands on Dunk Island, or known as Kanangalbar in the local Banjan language. So the story goes that once upon a time there was a very large shovel nosed ray that lived on the sand spit there. And the law there was you weren't allowed to fish on this sand spit because you couldn't capture this shovel nosed ray. It was sacred to the area. And this shovel nosed ray's name was Dewey Dewey. Now one day, a couple of teenage boys thought that they'd go out and capture Dewey Dewey just to show the rest of the uh, people on the island how strong and how brave they were and they should become men. So they paddled out with their canoe. They threw the line over the side with the line attached to the canoe. A little bit later that day, the line was bit and it was Dewey Dewey. Dewey Dewey took off with such great speed, it knocked the boys down to the back of the canoe. 
Now they were being towed along by Dewey Dewey because it was such a huge shovel nose ray. The elders on the island saw this happening and jumped into their canoes to try and capture the boys before they were taken away. So they started to paddle, paddle, paddle after the boys in the canoe. They eventually made their way down through the family group and to Hinchinbrook Island or Matamaraname as they called it. They came in through the northern channel and they chased them all the way down the southern channel until the sun went down. And as the twilight came and appeared, Dewey Dewey shot up out of the water into the sky with the boys trailing and attached behind him. The elders just had to watch this happen. When he went up into the sky, he then formed the Southern Cross. So now what we see is the Southern Cross is the shovel nose ray and the two stars down the bottom, the pointers, are the Alpha, Beta and Centauri are the two boys being dragged around along behind Dewey Dewey. So every night when the Southern Cross comes up, that is Dewey Dewey with the two boys telling us all that we should do what our elders tell us. Got a little Melamies. Oh, he's up in the tree. He's a little Melamies. Saying goodbye to Mulligan Falls this morning to make our way to George's Point where we'll be picked up after our four days of hiking here on Pinchinbrook, Matamatanami. One of our final creek crossings before we get out to the beach for our last hike. Now we're coming out of our last little section of forest. We've been through some rainforest, through some more swamp this morning and now we're coming out to the beach ecosystem here. I'm starting to see some of these casuarinas lining the shoreline again. We should see some creepers and vines on the dune area, but uh, now we're heading right out to the southern point of Hinchinbrook, Maramaradame. And yesterday afternoon, we could see these islands, Polaris to the left, Orpheus on the right, Great Palm in the background. So we have to walk about four or five k's down this beach and then we're off. All right guys, that's the 32 kilometer Thorsbourne Trail we've just completed. We're now at the southern end of Hinchinbrook, Maramaradame and we've traveled about 32 k's. Uh, the Thorsbourne Trail is named after Arthur and Margaret Thorsbourne who did a lot of uh, studies in this particular area and conservation work. Uh, so that's where that name comes from. It's been around since the early 1990s, this trail, and you're only allowed 40 people at a time on the island, which is great. It's uh, protected. It's been protected since 1932, this island. So it's in wonderful condition. We've had a great time on this area. We've now made it all the way back to Lucinda. You can see the, the uh, Lucinda jetty and terminal back here. The boat's just on its way in to pick us up. So, uh, Wherever you are, be safe, be happy, look after yourself. If you can't get out to somewhere like this now, start planning on getting out to somewhere like this. And when you go, remember, only leave your footprints and only take photos or videos. Have a good one.